everybody. My name is Megan Bacco. I'm the Director of Communications with Preservation Maryland. Thank you all so much for being here with us. Um, I was able to put this um, this uh, session together only because only because people in Maryland are doing very interesting things with museums, um, and nationally museums are leading the way in terms of salary equity. They're leading the way in terms of accessibility inside and out of their museums. And they're doing a lot to help us all understand what's happening in our current world by using history and artifacts um, and all the mistakes we've all already made. Um, so that's why I love museums. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, Marissa Allen, who's an associate architect at Quinn Evans Architects. who's going to show us some great examples of outdoor accessibility. Michelle Hartley, who is a media accessibility coordinator with the Park Service based in Harpers Ferry. Uh, as well as Dana Patera, who uh, works as the park manager for the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Park, which is a new state park on the Eastern Shore. So we're going to start with uh, Marissa Allen. And uh, please hold your, there are three presentations in a row. Hold your questions for the end. We'll have plenty of time. Um, thank you. Marissa. My name is Marissa Allen. I'm with Quinn Evans Architects. I've been with Quinn Evans Architects for about six years now. Um, we do a lot of adaptive reuse and preservation oriented practice. I am not a preservationist by training, but I'm trying very hard to catch up. I uh, went to the University of Maryland for both undergraduate and high school. I taught Don Don Linebaugh's uh, intro to preservation class here at the University of Maryland. I'm going to talk a little bit today about accessibility requirements and why we want to make our projects accessible. I'm working on a really awesome project for uh, the Natural History Building in D.C. If you guys have been down the mall lately, you'll notice that it is under construction right now. So I'm going to share that as uh, an example that I've been working on lately. And then I've got a couple other um, examples of outdoor accessibility. Maybe if you don't have as much of a, a scale or landscape to work with, what other things might you be thinking about? So just to get a sense of the audience here, how many of you guys work in or for museums or historic buildings? couple, yeah. So you guys are facing accessibility issues or you're just kind of curious how to make it maybe a little bit better? Yeah? Awesome. Do we have anybody from the kind of construction and design industry? Very nice. Do we didn't have any uh, manufacturers, product reps, fun stuff that us architects like to talk to. Very nice. Okay. So accessibility 101. Can you guys see the screen okay? Do we need to turn lights off real quick? Let's see if I can. Is that good? Are yeah. so good? Okay. So planning accessibility modifications. What uh, types of things are we talking about when we're talking about accessibility? We're talking about getting people to your buildings. You guys probably all have really awesome museums and you have awesome stories to share and you're trying your hardest to get as many people there as possible. How do we make everybody feel welcome? How do we allow them to physically get into and through your space? Um, when you're looking at accessibility in a historic structure, there's three main steps. Review your historical significance and identify your character-defining features. So what are the things in the building that are really non-negotiable? What makes your building special? And how can we best protect those, um, those features? And then assess the property's existing and required levels of accessibility. So how are you doing now? Can people with wheelchairs or walkers get into your space? Is there a place for them to park? Is there um, adequate resting space for them? Can they access the amenities once they're inside? Um, and when we look at the requirements, there's a few things, um, guidelines that we're thinking about, and we'll walk through some of those um, in a minute. And then evaluate your accessibility options. So oftentimes, this is through a feasibility study, and we're looking at a whole bunch of different layouts and options. What makes the most sense? What does the least damage? What's the most reversible option? Um, how can we have the, the lightest touch on the, the historic building? So our required levels of accessibility. Um, in 1990, the American, Americans with Disability Act was passed, and this is a law, it's not a building code. It's actually a civil rights issue. Are you discriminating against people who have accessibility issues? Are you welcoming them into your space? And it went into effect immediately. It's, uh, this applies to existing buildings, it applies to new buildings. And you are required to make any readily, avail readily achievable changes. So things that are easy, you should be thinking about doing. Um, and the readily achievable changes can change through time with your organization. So if you're taking on a major building project, 
things may be more readily achievable than they were if you weren't taking on a major building project. Um, there's also the sort of, if you touch it, you own it. So if you're upgrading something, if you're doing something to a door, you want to do your best to make that door accessible, as, as accessible as possible. Um, and there is a process going through SHPO review if you can't meet the accessibility requirements to look at waivers. It's a case-by-case -case process. Much of accessibility in historic buildings is a case-by-case -case process. Um, but we can talk about some things that you want to keep in mind. So the accessible group are um, a whole bunch of things fall under this parking, making sure that there's space for people to go, you guys have all seen handicap parking right up the lines next to it. That's so that people can get out of their cars easily. You don't have cars parked tight. Um, how are you getting them to the site? So are we sloping the landscape? Is there one step that they have to overcome when they're getting to the front of the building? Is it three steps? Um, how can we use ramps or slo slopes to get around that? Um, there's a lot of technical requirements about the, the slopes getting into a building. Your ramp slopes are allowed to be 1 to 12. Um, the kind of slope walkway is 1 to 20, so it's just about how shallow or how steep it can get. Any ramp is better than no ramp. If you can't quite get there, any ramp is better than no ramp. It gives people a chance to try, at least. Maybe they're feeling a little tired that day and they feel like they, they can't quite do it, but it's better than stairs. Um, and then doors have a lot of things to think about also. So how wide are the doors? What are the arrangements of doors? If you have a vestibule, you've got an inside door and an outside door, can a person in a wheelchair comfortably open that first door? Maybe, probably. Can they then have enough space for the interior vestibule door to open without hitting them? So how do we think about um, kind of the obstacles as they're moving, the door swings and things like that? Um, there's things that we can think about with hardware. One of the um, most interesting kind of door hardware things that I never really thought about until we started talking about it with someone was what happens if your, your hand's not as strong and you can't grasp a doorknob? You know, the little circular doorknobs are kind of hard to pull. Think about if you've, like, you know, you've hurt your hand a little bit. Do you have that grasp ability? So things like levers are a lot easier to, to push and pull. Um, signage is really important too. If you have an accessible entrance and it's not the main accessible entrance, how are you directing people to that? Do, does it feel like a back entrance? Do they feel like they're kind of being pushed to the side? Is there an equal experience for people that are coming in the accessible route versus the non-accessible route? And how, how are you queuing to them where they need to be? Um, you also need to be thinking about making your amenities accessible. And I think the, the next speakers are going to talk more about the interiors and exhibits and those kinds of things. Um, but are the displays accessible? Can they get to the information you're trying to share? Are the controls accessible? So uh, lighting, elevators, where are you putting your buttons, basically. Um, restrooms have a whole bunch of code requirements. They're less exciting sometimes than the exterior renovations, but are your stalls wide enough? Do you have the right grab bars? There's all sorts of rules and recommendations there. And then seating is one that we don't often think about, but how are we being nice to our visitors? Are we giving them a place to rest? You know, it might not be a code word requirement to have a bench halfway up your really long landscape, but it's probably a good idea to give people a chance to catch their breath if they need it. Some tools to think about. Um, National Park Service has an amazing preservation brief called Making Historic Properties Accessible. They have a bunch of resources linked to the bottom of it. If you're thinking about doing an accessibility project, you should definitely check this out. Um, there's ADA accessibility guidelines, so that's what goes with the ADA Act, it's got all the rules and requirements. Um, there's a readily achievable checklist for existing facilities. It's a really great document um, that gives a whole bunch of ideas that you should you could think about, kind of um, solutions and options to consider. And then code requirements, the Maryland Accessibility Code. You always have to check your local jurisdiction to see if they have kind of add-on codes to whatever the national standards are. That's kind of a baseline tools and tips for accessibility. And I want to share with you guys the project that I've been working on for the last three years. I'm really excited about it. We've gone all the way from feasibility now through we're in the middle of construction at the Natural History Building on the National Mall. Has anybody been to the building down there? It's the one big elephant in the center. Yeah. It's a beautiful building, and I can't believe I'm lucky enough to work on it. If you um, have been and you've entered the building from the south side, from the mall side, it's got this awesome historic dome. It was built in 1906. There's a beautiful terrace and a whole bunch of stairs. And the historic terrace is awesome, um, but it also creates a very large accessibility issue. Um, there's a 10-foot level change from the sidewalk on Madison Drive, the mall side, to the entrance portico. 
and uh, if you're an architect and you're following the, the technical slope conversation, to raise 10 feet, you need about 120 feet of ramp. So that's a lot. And that's a ramp at its steepest slope available. So at Natural History, we tried to come up with a solution that was a little bit more generous to the visitors. We had the space to work with, and I understand that not every uh, building project has the space to work with, but we had uh, space to stretch out a little bit, which was really nice. And we were also working with a very historic, beautiful building. It's symmetrical, it's monumental, it's on the mall. A lot of people had a lot of opinions about what the solution should look like. And we were thankful for all of their valuable input. But it took a long time to get to uh, an answer that really worked for everybody. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of what we came up with. So over the past 20 years, Natural History has tried to come up with an accessible solution for the South Entrance. And they came up with all sorts of crazy ideas. They've led three separate feasibility studies with different architects. I will tell you, Quinn Evans was one of the previous architects that also came up with crazy ideas. Um, we looked at, they, previous architects and Quinn Evans looked at uh, solutions that had uh, these glass boxes off to the side. We thought about bringing people up to new entries, kind of extending uh, an addition to the building. Do we bring them up? Do we bring them further down onto the site? Do we ramp down into the site and bring people lower and on the ground floor? Do we have mechanical lifts on either side? Ramps take up a lot of space. Can we do something that's an elevator? How do you do an elevator that's outside? Does it need a ton of maintenance? What does it look like? Is it this weird appendage on the outside of the building? I will admit that the ones on the bottom right were Quinn Evans feasibility sites from about 10, 15 years ago. And what do we make that elevator look like? They didn't pick our ideas then. We came up with a better solution now. Uh, this is what the historic building looks like. Here's some construction photos from the early 1900s, which I always think is super cool. Um, the interesting photo to me is the one on the bottom right. When they first built the building, you can see the portico on the right-hand side and the level of the Madison Drive sidewalk on the left-hand side. Um, and there used to be this grassy sloped hill that led down to this beautiful little path that went under the carriageway. It was lovely. In the 1960s, they decided that what they really needed at the front of this building was parking. Mm -hmm. you, you may have opinions about that. Uh, they built a retaining wall about here, and it no longer is a sloped site. So we also have cars on one level, people on another, and then people going even higher up to the, to the portico level. So we've got a lot of level changes happening in this area of the building. The building was extended over time, so of course it wasn't there in the beginning. Uh, we built, they built on the mall, and then they built these kind of wings onto the building, too. Um, and again, in the 1960s, they had all sorts of fun modifications. Um, so we're on the mall here. You can see the um, Washington Monument on the left, Capitol on the right. Again, kind of a really important vista. Um, so we've got a 10-foot level change on the south side of the building. They were really smart, and they built an accessible entrance on the north side of the building as fast as they could, because there wasn't as much of a level change to deal with there. The sidewalk was more level with the main entry. Um, and then somebody really clever decided that the accessible parking should be on the south side of the building, even though the accessible entrance was on the north side of the building. So you've got people who are coming together as a family. You've got a grandma, mom and dad, and two kids in a stroller. And they're parking on this side of the building. And someone who's walking with a stroller or with a walker or maybe just moves a little slower, it takes a little bit of time for them to get all the way around to the other side of the building. We estimated about 15 minutes from one side to the other. This is like three city blocks wide. Natural History is a gigantic museum. Uh, so it's really important to the museum that they create an entrance on the south side of the building. And they wanted the people who were coming to be able to use the historic 1906 stairs, they're gorgeous, why wouldn't you want to preserve that as the main entry to the building? But they wanted people who needed a little bit of extra help to be able to have a similar experience also. So how do we get people together at the front side of the building? This is what we came up with. Um, we've got raised walkways on either side. Here's the historic portico, you can kind of see it raised in the center. And there's ramps on both sides of the building. They're switched back, they have a landing at the end, and then they come up to the center. They tuck kind of in front of, um, they're kind of on the outside edge of the portico, they tuck behind an existing column and an existing plinth that had a, a planter on it. So we don't have a ton of space to work with as we're touching that existing building. Sorry. 
Um, but it was kind of the best way for us to bring people into that, into that space. And we love that people are coming together and sort of entering from the center. If you need to swing out to the sides, you do. But everybody's having a kind of similar experience. Um, so some of the things that we were thinking about, how do you add an addition like this to the outside of a building? How do you do this and have it look like it belongs? We were playing with the, the elevation. It already had this really nice base to it, so we were trying to keep everything pretty slim and in that base of the building from an elevation standpoint. Uh, we, it was really important that we kept things symmetrical. Do you really need two of these raised walkways? Well, from a practical standpoint, maybe not. It helps with visitor flow, for sure. You can have one up and one down, or it's wide enough to have people kind of going in both directions on both walkways. From a historic elevation, it really sits a lot nicer being symmetrical. It really, like, it feels like it could have always been there. Um, from a material standpoint, the building is granite. It's a Milford pink granite, so it's kind of a gray pink color. Um, we picked a Lake Placid granite to go with it, so it's not exactly the same. You'll be able to tell that it is in addition to the building, but it, it feels like it belongs. It's kind of, uh, the base is heavy, um, which is really nice. So zoom in on that plan. When we were looking at the, the slopes for this walkway, I say walkway because technically this is not a uh, ramp, it's a walkway. Um, our slopes are closer to 1 to 20 for, this, uh, for these walkways. It's really nice. It gives people a little bit of extra um, kind of time and space to breathe. When we were looking at the railings, we were looking at um, kind of natural motifs. Uh, that were already on the building, and we came up with this really classy, elegant um, grass railing pattern. This isn't exactly what the final one's going to look like. I'm sharing some kind of design renderings with you now. Um, but it's kind of blades of grass. It's going to be a uh, cast white bronze. It's going to be really lovely. And we wanted the ramp to not feel like an add-on, but that it was a really nice part of the building. If people are going to want to walk up this, it's going to be lovely. We also provided handrails in places that we didn't technically need them, but we thought that that would be a nice addition for people who are kind of moving through the space. We had to go through all sorts of Commission of Fine Arts um, review, National Capital Planning Commission. Many of you guys have done projects in DC, you know that's um, a, a hurdle to get through. Um, we did point cloud scanning on this project, which was really awesome. It enabled us to build a 3D model and then 3D print the model, and we were able to kind of test and try um, pieces and um, design solutions, which is really cool. We also 3D printed the railing pieces so that the Commission of Fine Arts could touch something and really see what that railing was going to be like and look like. Here's a night render. I just feel like it's going to be really gorgeous. Um, we also used the point cloud scanning to look at slopes and determine exactly where we needed to cut out existing stone. We were touching as light as we could as possible on the existing building, but you'll notice that there's um, some steep slopes over here in the corners, so we are going to um, provide new granite in those locations, but it's not going to trip people once they get up this beautiful um, way. Um, I think I'm probably getting close to time. I have some other examples, but I think we can let some of the other presenters go, and if we have time at the end, we can swing back to those. You were giving me two minutes, is that good? That works? Awesome. Alright, hello everyone and thanks so much for having me today. Um, I'm excited to talk about universal design, accessibility, and the public that we serve. And first I want to cover why we do this, right? So let's just get the legalities out of the way, and they've already been discussed a little bit. In 1990, President Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act. On either side of him, and the picture to your right, are two disability rights activists. And they spent a lot of years demonstrating, promoting, lobbying for the civil rights legislation. Um, on your left is um, uh, folks, disability rights activists and their families, uh, showing, demonstrating why they needed this law. It's called the Capitol Crawl. They got out of their wheelchairs. Um, they had to leave behind their canes, and they literally had to crawl up the Capitol steps because that was how they could access the building. So why do we do it? I think we do it because it's the right thing to do, right? We want to welcome people. Um, we have social reasons, personal reasons, organizational reasons that speak to our mission about welcoming all people and including all people. One out of every five people in the United States 
are estimated to have a disability. Um, so one out of every five people, that's a lot of people, approximately 20% of the population. When you add to that our family members and our friends, that expands even greater, right? So people uh, may decide not to go to your museum or your exhibit if it's not accessible, not because they have a disability, but because one of their family members or friends who they want to engage with, interact with, have a social fun experience with, can't go along. So the how do we do it is the challenge, right? And recently the American Alliance for Museums working group on inclusion, accessibility, diversity, and equity put out a report um, about this very issue. How we do it is we have conversations with our leaders, so from the top all the way down to our people on the front line. For accessibility, we need to plan early and often. We need to revisit these issues, and we need to be willing to engage in conversations that challenge us. Because as was already said, accessibility is a civil rights issue. I would say it's a human rights issue. And those are hard issues to talk about. Some people feel uncomfortable. Some people feel challenged. Some people feel like it's, um, it's a, a, a complex and conflicting dialogue to have, but it's a good dialogue to have. And it's not just because it's making things accessible, again, for people with disability. Accessibility and universal design is really our aim. Universal design helps everyone. So the idea of universal design actually comes from the architectural world, and the original definition is that it's a design of products and environments to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible with the least need for adaptation or specialized design. And there are seven principles that go into that. I have a poster up there that shows you what those are. I'm not going to go into them, but I am putting this up there so that you know there actually is universal design as a definition. It's kind of people intuit what it is, but it actually has a real definition and principles that go along with it. So universal design, as I said, benefits everyone. In the built environment, think curb cuts. Curb cuts are there for people who use wheelchairs so that they can cross the street and access sidewalks. But they benefit uh, families who have kids in strollers, they benefit travelers who have wheeling um, suitcases, they benefit people in urban, urban environments who are wheeling their groceries. In the museum world, universal design, think tactiles. Tactiles are often created for people who are blind or have low vision. But everyone loves to touch a tactile, right? Everyone loves to touch a model. Kids love to touch models. And models become a touchstone. They become that tangible thing that you can connect to that's like a portal into the idea that you're trying to convey. It is something tangible that people hold in their memories and take with them. So I'm going to talk about some exhibit hallmarks related to accessibility and universal design that we often think about when we're thinking about accessibility. Typography. And I went to Harriet Tubman after it was um, installed. It was really exciting. Uh, and a lot of my examples relate to Harriet Tubman. So typography is something we talk a lot about. Typography, you want it to be clear, you want it to be big enough, you don't want it to be on a pattern background. The benefit, of course, is for people who have blue vision. But when I was at Harriet Tubman, this busload of people came in, and there was a pretty big crowd around these exhibits. And I could read those uh, large titles from a distance. So it benefited me, because I could decide, do I want to stick around, or do I want to come back um, when there's less of a crowd? So typography is something to think about when you're creating a permanent exhibit, temporary exhibit, traveling exhibit. Open captions. There are lots of people who have hearing loss. People who won't admit it to themselves, who won't admit it to their family. How many of you had a conversation with grandma or your mom or your dad about how the TV is, right? So they will go to situations and watch videos and they can't hear it. Um, it's best just to have open captions because they won't necessarily ask for equipment that helps them hear better. In addition, it helps people who, uh, for whom English may not be their, their first language. 
So hearing the program along with reading the captions helps them as well. Reach ranges are so important. I have a couple of examples of that. Up at the top, we have a woman who is blind, and she is interacting with the tactile map. Um, we tried really hard to make sure that we kept that within a reasonable reach range, and she's probably at the top of her comfort zone, right? So we have to think about all kinds of people who are different heights, different shapes, different sizes. We have someone using a wheelchair. Um, she can access this topographic map from a variety of places. However, we might have made the topographic map a little too big because she's got some movement restrictions. Clearly, we missed the mark with this mom and her child who she had to pick up to, so that she could engage in the viewing scope. So retrainers are really important. Seating, already talked about that. So important for all of us, right? For our family members who might just have had knee replacement. Thank you. For, um, for people who are recovering from chemotherapy sessions. Backs, back rests and arm, arm rests are critical in that process. And on um, the other side, I have a picture of the White House Visitor Center. We chose to do a combination of things, and uh, some benches with backs and some without. And so we have this lovely social engagement of kids facing one another to chat. Audio description is for people who are blind or have low vision. Um, it describes the visual features of an exhibit along with text, and that can also help people who have print-related disabilities such as dyslexia. Tackles, I've already mentioned that. This is my favorite one at Harriet Tubman. Um, it's the scale, which would be really hard just to describe, but that scale has a story related to disabilities history. Harriet Tubman was hit with a five pound weight when she was a little girl. Um, that is attributed to lifelong seizures that she had. Am I, am I hitting the right? All right, okay, good. I'm always worried when I step into the interpretive side. Um, so not only are we making it accessible, we're connecting to a disabilities history story and to people who have experienced traumatic brain injuries. So we have guidelines as well. They're on our website and supplementary materials. Please feel free at any time to have a look at them and use them. Um, so there are changes big and small and today and tomorrow that you all, I know, want to think about and are thinking about. And I think it's important to reflect on some questions. What do you do a lot of? What is most significant about your resource? What partnerships can you take advantage of? How do you communicate with the public? How do you train your staff and your volunteers? Those answers will give you information to strategically plan. If you conduct a lot of programs, maybe you want to focus on providing assistive listening. If your building is or your museum is about architecture and artifacts, maybe you want to create tackles. Um, do you have inaccessible resources that you need to create alternate uh, formats for? What do you communicate to the public um, on your web and print? How do you train your staff for cultural awareness? So you can brainstorm some things, because I know budgets are limited. Um, can you work with the university partner and do some 3D modeling? Can you create large print in-house of your printed materials? Sensitivity and awareness training, there are lots of videos on the web related to understanding better um, people with disabilities. Uh, audio description training, we provide pre-recorded audio description, it's expensive, but your curatorial staff and volunteers could take training. And please invite the community in, people with disabilities, because they can help you prioritize. I just want to make one plug for um, also something you can do and take advantage of today, which is a National Park Service project at the University of Hawaii. It's called UDV. You can create audio described versions of your print materials by using this um, web-based editing tool. Use it, tell us how you like it. We'd love to hear it. It's available for everyone. And that's it. I want to thank you all for thinking about accessibility. And don't hesitate to contact me. Um, and please poke me if I don't respond to you. I promise I will, but sometimes it takes me a little while. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dana Patera, as uh, Megan mentioned earlier, and I work with the Maryland Park Service. 
as the park manager at Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad State Park and Visitor Center in scenic and historic Church Creek, Maryland. And just to give you a little bit of background information before we get into um, the accessible components of the exhibits, the uh, state of Maryland has 17 acres that's surrounded by Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. Um, the design concept, the view north, was really used to shape the vision for the um, park, the main architectural features, the visitor experience, and the exhibit design. It's all based on a uh, northward movement, symbolizing an enslaved person's journey to better their circumstances. Also important to the state of Maryland, um, we're, we incorporated green features into the um, architectural design of the park. So you can see, let's see, over here on the exhibit building, we have a green roof. Um, we have green roofs that are in between each of the main pavilions. Um, we have an administration building that has an entire green roof. We have solar tubes to allow natural light to filter in, a geothermal HVAC system, a bacteria-fueled septatech system, um, as well as photovoltaic exterior lighting. Um, so just a, a few of the green features that we're very proud of. And we were recently awarded the uh, LEED Silver Certification. Um, here we were a little over 15 months ago at our grand opening, and you can see our guest of honor there, uh, Mrs. Tubman, next to Governor Hogan. Uh, since that day, well, in the first year of being open, I should say, we have seen over 100,000 guests from over 60 countries and all 50 states. And as I just learned from Michelle, uh, one out of every five likely has some sort of learning challenge or um, special need that um, we are trying to accommodate. So working with our partners at Harpers Ferry and the National Park Service, it was really important that we make our experience enjoyable to as many people as possible. Um, so as you enter into the building, the first um, and arguably the most photographed exhibit you encounter is this bust of um, Harriet Tubman. And I think the first thing people notice is that she's only five feet tall. Um, she was a woman of very petite uh, stature. And um, this is really the first tactile. We didn't think of it that way, but we do see people interact with the, this in a very respectful way, especially those um, that have visual impairments. Um, and there is a lot of detail to be found in uh, getting up close and personal with this bust. Uh, she has the scarring on the back of her neck um, that is, um, shows where she was whipped and beaten as a young child. The scar above her right eye is present uh, from where she was hit in the head with the, the lead weight. Um, and across the, the base of the bust are broken chains symbolizing her um, escape from the bondages of slavery and her rescuing others uh, from the bondages of slavery. So there's a lot to be uh, found by touching this um, bust. Uh, before you enter the permanent exhibit space, you have a wayfinding map, and it has both the raised lettering as well as um, the, the Braille translation. The first tactile that you encounter in the exhibit space, and I actually have an example of what we elected to use for our tactiles, the material, so if you want to just kind of touch it and uh, pass it around. It is a pigment impregnated resin with a clear coat on top. Um, we looked initially at bronze and it was really expensive. So this is probably about a third of the cost, I think, of what a bronze tactile would be. And these range in price from four to $10,000 each. Um, so they do hold up very well uh, because the resin is impregnated. Um, the color's impregnated into the resin. As much as you can wear on them, you'll still see that color um, present. But the first tactile that people come to, everyone touches it. They walk out of this egg-shaped theater where they're immersed in Tubman's world, and they walk over to this, and they just put their hands on it. And they start feeling the rose on the corn cob and the indentations in the oyster shells. 
um, and children, adults, everybody, they walk over and they just put their hands on it. And I think that is what uh, Michelle was saying earlier, they're connecting in a different way with the information that we're conveying with Tubman's story. Here's a close-up of that panel. You can see the raised lettering and the braille next to the tactiles. Um, and here's a, a picture that shows the reach range. With all the tactiles, we really took into consideration reasonable reach range so that um, folks that do use a, a wheelchair um, can fully experience the exhibit. Um, and this particular exhibit illustrates through a tactile the differences between the size homes that were located on the eastern shore during Tubman's time based on class. So you've got the tactile, you've got the name labels with raised letters, and you have the braille. Um, here we see a three-dimensional scene with uh, Tubman and a her pair of oxen. And if you look below, you'll see uh, that we have a six-inch tactile model. There's also interpretation with raised lettering and braille located on that same panel. Everywhere that we have a reconstructed scene like this, there is a six-inch model of that scene. And like Michelle said, it's not just folks that are visually impaired. It's, it really does connect children with this because it's such a heavy topic. Um, it, it, it's nice to be able to connect with our younger visitors. Here we see Tubman checking the muskrat traps. You can see right next to that scene, the six inch model. And then we introduce our first uh, sound stick. Uh, we do have audio uh, transcripts available for those that would like to use the, them. And you'll notice on the side of the interpretive panel here, there is a space for a panel that will have braille on it. So you can pull out and have the braille um, trans, uh, transcribed from this written text here. Um, up on top, the menu has the raised lettering and the braille as well, and there's a volume control on the sound stick. Um, that's the tactile that um, Michelle had in her Pro, uh, presentation and it is the replicated model from the Bucktown Village store and the uh, weights that you can pick up um, and then the, the two pound lead weight which is what Tubman was hit in the head with. You can feel exactly how heavy that is. Um, here we have Tubman as she is leaving Poplar Neck in Caroline County closing the gate uh, behind Dr. Anthony Thompson. She's singing the goodbye song to let her friends and family know that she is leaving. And down below, um, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see the tactile of that scene. And we also have, in raised lettering, the lyrics to the goodbye song, as well as the, the braille transcription. All of the interactives are at a reasonable reach range, and they all include raised lettering and braille. So that's the, the flip-up panel there that you see. And of course, we have the open captioning with all of our videos. Um, here we have a corn crib that helps interpret the story of the rescue of her three brothers. And you can, the doorway is 36 inches wide. Once you go in, it's 60 inches wide and I think 48 inches deep. So you do have room for a wheelchair to get in. Uh, here you see the Cumbie River Raid. Tubman was the first woman to lead an armed raid in the Civil War. And this exhibit um, is a reconstructed scene from that story. You can see below the tactile, the raised lettering, the braille, the sound station. Um, and uh, what we want to leave people with is a positive message. So here you can come and you can sit beside Tubman, either on the bench or in a chair next to the bench, and really reflect on her life and legacy and what that means to you. Now we also have features on the exterior of the building, such as um, the reserved parking, the accessible route is incredibly important. When we first opened, we did not have the signage to point people in the right direction for the accessible route. So we were having um, folks walk down the driveway to where we don't, did not have a cutout in the curb and say that we were not accessible. Um, so we 
we went ahead and purchased the signs and made sure we were marking that area well. We've got the accessible parking in the staff area. We have a large number of senior groups visit the center, so we found out very quickly that two wheelchairs were not going to cut it. Um, and, you know, whether somebody uses a wheelchair 100% of the time or not, when you are older, sometimes it's a lot more comfortable to go through a museum and sitting down than it is to spend a lot of time on your feet. Um, so we let people know that we have wheelchairs available through signage, through our website. When we have group tours, uh, call and arrange ahead of time a, a tour. We also ask about any special needs so that we can be prepared to accommodate those guests. Our pathways and trails outside are also accessible. Um, we have a pavilion that actually has several accessible picnic tables. And we are lucky enough to have on staff with us, he's been with us for about eight months now, Ranger Rowe. And he is very generous with his advice as far as um, what works and what doesn't work in our exhibit space and our programming. Um, here you can see him leading an educational program with a group of junior rangers. Um, we have also hosted several groups, including Blind Industry Services of Maryland. And this group was really fantastic because we, the two ladies kind of in the middle in the blue and in the green jacket are the group leaders and they visited with us ahead of time and worked with a ranger so that she could better prepare her tour to cater to their needs. And they had a spectacular experience. You can see there Ranger Crenshaw and they are engaging with the bust um, of Tubman and you know she's telling them how tall Tubman was and they're actually able to see through their uh, hands. Um, and she was a petite woman and um, the scarring and whatnot. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. As far as the cost of the braille panels, uh, they range from $300 to $800 each. Um, in next month, we expect another major install with our electronic programs. We have accessible, like 32 inch touch screens that are going to go in. We um, will be getting our audio descriptive tour. I have a draft right now in my bag that I'm reviewing. Um, and we'll have assisted listening, or yes, assisted listening devices available as well. Um, so we are 90% there, and hopefully by the end of July, we'll, we'll be complete uh, with most of our um, exhibits, main exhibit features anyway. Um. I will um, echo the thought that having somebody with a disability on your design team is a huge advantage. Having a ranger, I'm sure, was a big help. We have at the Smithsonian, Bessie Barth is the director of accessibility. And the things that she brought to our attention were things I might not have thought about before. Even down to the texture of the pavement, the aggregate size in your concrete can have a rumble effect on a wheelchair going up a raised walkway. Not something I would have thought about if we didn't have that on the team. Um, so I had a couple of exterior examples that I wanted to um, share with you guys. This one is the Metropolitan Memorial United Methodist Church. That's a mouthful, but it's a, a gorgeous project on Nebraska Ave in D.C. And these are just some examples of sort of smaller scale raised walkways or um, ramp stair combinations that you could be looking at if you have a little bit less space. Um, obviously the building was existing and they were really using um, kind of complementary materials to look at a, um, a ramp solution. One of the nice things about this too is that the ramp stops at a couple locations. So on the site plan here you can see there's a little ramp that gets you to the plaza space and then another ramp that gets you up into the entrance. So giving people access not only to the building but also the gathering space is, is really important. Um, we had, a, as I was pulling slides for this and photos for this, I found an email from one of the clients saying how excited they were that they had parishioners who hadn't been able to come to church for more than two years um, actually come back to service because they had now installed this raised walkway. It's always exciting to see, see that. Um, if you are in an urban environment or have a little bit more space, it's often nice to incorporate landscape into your raised walkways. So here's an example of a school project in D.C. It's the Marie Reed Community Learning Center over in Northwest. Um, and there's a whole landscaped outdoor area that's kind of bioretention and stormwater areas. And there's a beautiful stair that goes down the center, but also um, sloped walkways to get people down and again into that outdoor gathering space. Um, here's an example at a larger scale of um, a big landscape 
And one of the things they looked at here was providing accessible walkways through the landscape. They couldn't do it everywhere, but they used a reinforced path so that they could still get the sort of dirt road feel, but that it was a soil that was compacted enough so that it was a, um, a solid walking surface for people. You would definitely get some rumble in a wheelchair here, but again, some path is better than no path. Um, here's an example of an early 1900s school building. They unfortunately had a terrible fire. I guess that's fire on the bottom right corner. Sometimes catastrophic events like this open opportunities to upgrade your facilities, and in this case, um, they were not able to provide a ramp or raised walkway to the 1900s um, addition, but they built, or to the 1900s original building, but they built an auditorium off the back as they rebuilt what had burned away. And um, they had this very nice kind of slope stair ramp situation. They're working with a little bit of slope in the topography, and it's really just two stairs on one side and four stairs on the other, but that's enough to need, um, need a ramp or slope walkway. Um, here's another example at Richmond Old City Hall. They have this kind of wonky and not so pretty, um, just sort of temporary ramp added to the outside of the building. And here's some renderings of a proposed, um, not temporary, uh, addition to the side of the building. This is one that I really like too, um, another kind of smaller scale example. It's the Little Theater of Alexandria. It's not a glamorous ramp by any means, but they were able to keep the existing stair in place and just build a ramp on top of it. So wherever you can keep the existing fabric, that's, that's nice too. Um, at the moment, the outdoor ramp and elevator, uh, lift and elevator situations can be hard from a mechanical standpoint. Maybe in 15 years, they'll come up with really, something really snazzy, and everyone will be able to have exterior lifts that don't need uh, much maintenance. Uh, until that time, it's nice to be able to preserve that, uh, that historic fabric in place where you can. Uh, I think that was a couple more ramp options. Here's an interior one. Uh, if you're looking at theater or auditorium spaces, thinking about where you're distributing seating through the space can be very important too. Um, in the Terrace Theater previously at the Kennedy Center, there was only seats at the very back of the auditorium, and that kind of stinks. Um, so with the renovation, they were able to get people closer to the stage. They've got some middle seats. They've still got seats at balconies in the back. And they made the stage accessible, which is huge. Think about having an award ceremony or a speaker. You're trying to bring in an artist or an expert, and they have a disability. How do you get them into your space? Um, so that one was it's really awesome to be able to see people up on the stage now. So those were my kind of smaller scale examples, maybe not this one, but yeah. smaller scale examples of Can you that one? This one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, Embassy of Australia, and uh, they were able to keep the existing stair and build a, a ramp. And it's not a ton of stairs, again, it's two or three steps that they're trying to overcome. Um, but, you know, one foot of raise requires 12 feet of ramp, so it's a... Uh, you need a little bit of room to be able to do those because so complex. Um, 